Yes, you lovely people. If you're not already, make sure you give us a follow over on Spotify. Cleggy was just, you were kicking off all I the time. Off big time. Big time. During that time is when Wayne Rooney was doing it. Ro- Rooney was the main one. Rooney, I'll honestly, was a, was a, was a, because he, he's an animal. Right, like, absolutely. And he is competitive as heck. Like, if you think I'm competitive, right, he is, it could be tiddlywinks and that guy will kick off. That, that can destroy careers. Yeah, That's for sure, thing, yeah. So I was going absolutely apeshit about it. Hello, everybody. This is the Fozcast today. With me, as usual, I'm joined with my friend Tom. How are you, Tom? Very good, mate. How's yourself? Uh, very, very good. We've got an exciting guest in the studio with us today. We have got the all-time, like, original bad boy power development coach. Is that what I'm going to call you? That's the one. Power development coach, Michael Clegg. He has worked with some of the biggest names in football. He was at Manchester United Basically, when they started being the monsters that they are, I've worked with Rooney, Ronaldo, Ferdinand, Vidic, Sir Alex Ferguson, you name it, he's been there, he's seen it. You've been there from the start, haven't you, Cleggy? Well, it was the start of 2000. Yeah. You know, they just won the treble, United. So, um, Alex Ferguson was putting a lot into getting the training centre up to the very best it could be, you know, then he put a lot of good ideas in. And fortunately, I became one of the ideas because of my kids who played there uh, how does that feel cleggy when you're, you're from that area you're a man united fan right yeah. and then you get the call to say do you fancy coming to work for man united well it's it worked in two different ways because the first time i got a call was from um brian kidd yeah and he was asking me about doing plyometrics because he knew through my kids all the types of training i was doing he wanted to introduce new things at carrington you see at, at that time at that time in football sort of gym work it was a thing obviously right but sort of that next level that sort of next sort of the new thing was sort of plyometrics and power and all that that was just starting to become a thing right yeah exactly and you and the you were the guy they wanted to bring in to try and do it yeah the only problem was brian's thinking first team and i could understand that but plyometrics was fairly new and you have to get kids doing that when they're younger okay. to develop it for when they're older. Whereas if you start off when they're older doing plyometrics, you can easily have uh, problems, you know, damaged knees, hips. Oh, injuries ankles, basically, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which so, is a problem when you're working with a Man United first team and they want you to hit the ground running and just improve people, not injure people. Yeah, Pallister Bruce and, uh, you know, Schmeichel and people like that. I said, Brian, I, I couldn't do it. I oh, know you'll be all right. You know, I said, look, you know, I've only ever done this with kids. And the kids are coming on, but the kids, yeah, you're, you've got top players, you know, in the world there. I, I couldn't start doing that, you know what I mean, with them. Yeah. So he was a bit annoyed with me because he, you know, he, he could see Michael and Stephen, who were very, very powerful lads, you know, and very fit lads. But I wouldn't do it because I know that you can get a bad name as easily as you can get a. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically, if you walk through the door and some of these big boys are getting injuries straight away, it's like, ah, come, come on, mate, that'll do. Exactly. Back out the door again, yeah. Exactly. So I said that and he, he was upset because he, he had in his mind what he wanted to do and I can understand that. But I couldn't start teaching things that I hadn't put to adults, yeah. especially top line footballers, you know what I mean? It had to be tested for a bit longer for me to yeah. really understand it. You know. So just for a bit of uh, context, Cleggy, obviously both your lads were at United at the time. Um, you were well known in Manchester for all the work you'd done with the gym and et cetera, et cetera. So is it fair to say that that the kind of club looked at your kids and kind of thought, wow, so he's doing something a bit different here. Yeah, well, exactly that, yeah. It was mainly uh, Rob Swire, actually. Rob Swire was the, the, the junior physio at the time. But um, because Michael and Stephen had gone in, I got, got to talking to him about different training methodologies and also injury prevention and stuff like that. And he was really looking for stuff himself, Rob. And when he, he came to the gym, you see, and I showed him all the stuff I did with boxing and plyometrics and Olympic lifting and everything, that's perfect for the club. But of course, he was only a junior at the time. So I think he went and made it known what was going on. And then, of course, um, Brian went to, uh, Brian Kidd went to be manager of Blackburn Rovers. Yeah. And he took the head physio. So then Rob Swire become the head Moved physio. Moved up, well, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And yeah. as soon as that happened, it, it was moving into Carrington. It was all like, almost like doors opening in incredible ways to give me an opportunity. Yeah. And this was in 2000, wasn't it? 2000 when yeah. I first went in. I first went in doing the under 18, you know, the, the youth players. Yeah. Um, and so our Stephen was one of them. So I did a lot of boxing and jumps and plyometrics and 
weightlifting and everything and they loved it. Was that because it's safer to put you with the 18s to start with a new guy through the door and with what you're saying you're going to do, it's difficult to do it straight away with the first team? Absolutely, team's. because at the end of the day, you know, my main training was with kids. Yeah. It was always kids, you know, from six years old all the way up then. And you're learning through experience what, what works and what doesn't work and yeah. what can be potentially dangerous. So I had the opportunity with my own kids. And of course, you know, I, I had four kids, uh, four lads who were doing all this different training. And, and what they do, they're doing training, so the mates come and train with them. And if the mates come and train with them, then you end up being known by the schools that yeah, you're yeah, going. Yeah. So, you know, the schools are inviting me in to do all these sorts of things. Then the schools find out, and it all just starts, you know, building up. And then ultimately, uh, the great thing was this, I, I wrote a power development co course with uh, what I call Lee Sidebottom years and years ago. And uh, we started to develop with that because I was a weightlifting coach. But also I did the shot put javelin discus, sprints, hurdles, and all that sort of thing with all the kids at the day. And my time is building as my kids grow older. Where, where, how do you learn to do all this stuff, Cleggy? Do you know what I mean? Did you, like, are you reading books right, left and center? Or are you literally the kind of guy where it's, it's hands-on, it's proven, it's tried and tested? I, I, I've read very few books, yeah. to be honest with you. My training was about watching my kids develop. There's one thing about training your kids is the main, main and most important thing is you love them. So first of all, you want to, you don't want to do any damage, mm. but you also want to give them the best opportunities. Yeah. So I looked all the time, whether they was doing weightlifting or football or boxing or whatever, and I looked at them compared with other people. And as you're looking at them, you can see if they're boxing with somebody, where Mike's lacking, where Stephen's lacking. Yeah, you know? yeah. and, that, and so what you do is you look at what they've got and you put, the bit that they haven't got. Add it into it. Add it into what yeah. my kid hadn't got. And you could see that it works. As long as you pay attention and you know what they're doing, you start showing them the other bits that they've got, you know, the, the, the yeah, other bits, yeah, yeah. a good boxer or a good weightlifter or, or whatever. And then you train it into your kids. And, and it's all about the minds of kids. Well, if, if they're training getting somebody who's a really good boxer, it, they don't want to keep getting punched. Yeah. So they say, right, you're going to have to defend yourself like this and you're going to have to throw your punches like that. So they'll listen to you. You know, if they go in a weightlifting competition, what do you win? It's about winning, you yeah. know, and well, how can I beat him? Because look at what it can do. So we do some training and, and it works. And so everything's building up. So I, think, I think this is, for me, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is why... Like, I, I didn't want to just sort of in, introduce you as, like, power development coach, right. right? Because I don't think it's as simple as that, yeah? Yeah, you said it, that at the, at the, before we went on yeah, air. What, what shall I introduce you as? And you were like, that's not really fair, is it's it? It's not really fair because it's not about just, like, for, to, for me, like, a power development coach is basically somebody in the gym that says, right, if you want to get stronger, do this, do that, do And that's it. It's as simple as that. But it's not because what I, I haven't worked with you for years and years and years, and knowing you as a person is that you take everybody as a complete individual, yeah? And you will judge them, you'll get to know them, you'll find out what they're good at and what they're not good at. And then you will tailor it completely individually to what they are as a player, what they are as a sports person and go, right, you're really good at doing that, but you need to add that in because you're good at doing that. But this is the bit that lets you down on a Saturday afternoon and blah, blah, blah. And that's the bit, I think nowadays it's got two sports science here, yeah? I do, Cleggy, where it's like they think they can just do like blanket gym sessions or something like that. And everybody does the same thing, but everybody's different. You've got different positions, different ages, heights, weights, everything like that, haven't well, they? Tell us about your, because you, your consultation process is a little bit different because you were t yeah. telling me about it, weren't you? So your consultation process, I was reading with, with Keno um, in particular to start with was, was about having a cup of tea, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. If you want to work with somebody properly, you've got to know something about them, you know, find out what their, their experiences yeah. are, you know, what they're good at, what they like and don't like. Because you don't want to start pushing them to do something they don't like if there's other things you can do that they will like, you know yeah. what I mean? You want their training to be enjoyable. And that was the thing with Roy. He'd done some boxing before, you know, but he weren't doing any boxing at United. So I said, well, we could do some of that. He said, oh, could we? I said, yeah. But, you know, um, I've heard people saying that I was in the ring with Roy Keane, you know, slogging it out. That's totally untrue. I didn't do any. <laughs> we didn't do boxing as in sparring. Yeah. It was about using the focus mitts and boxing techniques that apply to football. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Taking the bits that are important that you can splice onto somebody that can help them in football or whatever it is, the weightlifting techniques you can do that will splice into a footballer to give him more power 
you know, far. I've got school. a quote. I've got a quote from the book that I really like. Cleggy, listen oh. to this one. This as soon as I read it, I thought, oh yeah, I like that one. That's really really nice. Um, and, and it goes like this. It's about what passion you can stir within them to give them the drive to get ready for whatever they need to do in their sport. So basically, whatever it is, whoever you're working with, whatever it is, whatever session you're putting on for them, it's how to apply to them, how to get them to go, yeah, this is going to really push me today. This single thing is going to push me. And I think that is, that's why I didn't want to introduce you as a power coach, because you see somebody as a complete individual and then you will trigger something in them to go you little mank dickhead i'm gonna do this to beat you today like <laughs> that's the beauty of what you were doing back in the day though well that's power it's the power of the mind what you're doing is stirring them in their mind yeah. and that's what makes them powerful it's not the exercise itself of course you've got to do the exercise but it's what you put into the exercise yeah. that makes them powerful now one of the things that you must remember i used to tell stories yeah. king david and stuff like that you know uh I, I try and inspire them in some way with a little story that made them think about their situation yeah. and what they're going through. You get inspired by a little story. Well, there's no weightlifting going on. There's no boxing going on at the moment. You inspire their minds. Yeah. So that's where the power is in the mind. What they do then is transfer the knowledge that you're giving them of how to do an exercise that will relate to what they ultimately want to do. And it's a process that you've got to work through. Yeah. And it doesn't come from a computer it yeah. comes through consultation it comes through um relationships building a rapport with somebody building a relationship now the thing about it is what you're building and this will sound corny for your podcast but it's about love yeah i'm not talking about love you have for a girl because she's nice there's different love, levels of love exactly. though. exactly yeah there's lots of different levels of love and what you do when you build a relationship is you build a respect a rapport and a love for each other and then you're looking with more passion at what they need and what they tell you i mean some of the hin injuries we had at united yeah. you know alan smith and yeah. you know yeah. others you know horrendous um injuries and they want to get right mm. so i work with the physios and the physios are fantastic at united rob swire and john Dyan yeah. and you know uh, Neil Huffy. Huffy and yeah. uh, richie great guys yeah. I, I love them guys because they re really were passionate themselves and what i can do is learn from their um physio bit into the rehabilitation where, where we start working together and then we become a team and it's not just about me or the physio or the player it's about us working as a team yeah and we have to understand each other what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and so that we're always talking about the players and what's going to help them to be at the best yeah. but the most important thing is, is inspiring their minds that they're capable of overcoming the problem but actually during this period you know you're having a rest from play and we can work on things that you've never had before yeah, it's true. become an even better player yeah i think um one thing i've learned over my career and obviously i've had plenty of injuries i've done my, my cruise at three times all that kind of stuff but i think because I was at Man United at a younger age, I got to see up close and personal the people that you're talking about there, like Huffy. When I did my ACL, Huffy was my was my was my sort of like um, physio basically, um, and I needed to feel like I had somebody like like a dad basically, like overseeing the whole thing. But then also when I went to work with Cleggy, it was already it had already been spoken about that morning about what we were going to do and how to treat me. And then Huffy knows me as a character. Cleggy would know me as a character and then they could tailor it into a way that would appeal to me. And not only that, so, so at any time I'm doing an exercise, I might be tired, I might be a bit sore, a bit stiff or whatever. I know that whatever exercise I'm doing, it's for the benefit of me. It is for the benefit of me. And that was, I think that was a really good grounding for me is getting to see those guys at Man United, yourself, Huffy, Davo, Richie, all those kind of guys, how they worked. And that sort of held me in good stead going forward. So then whenever I did get more injuries, which I bloody did, by the way, because I got more cruise ships, I got broken foot, things like that, you know, I knew how to deal with it and, and move forward with it. It was really, really good grounding in that, in that sense anyway. That's really interesting. So, so Claggy, what were your um, first impressions of a young Ben Foster? <laughs> oh, I can't say that in public. Yeah, you can. <laughs> I'll tell you my first impressions of you. Go on. <laughs> you go first. He was young and he was really wanting it so much, so much uh, that he'd, he'd given everything to, you know, be the first team uh, goalkeeper working towards being the best goalkeeper he could ever be. You know what I mean? Sometimes you've got to sort of 
you know, say, hold back a bit, let's do this, let's not get too much of that. You know, he was uh, quite headstrong, you know, he really wanted things. Y you can tell from the p passion of his podcast <laughs> what he's been like, you know what I mean? So that's always something that you've really got to work with, you know what I mean? You've really got to understand each other. We had a great um, time, yeah. um, what was it, about four years yeah, or something yeah. like that, you know, we worked together. And, and I really, I got to like the guy. I mean, you know, I was also working with a lot of others, but me and Ben got on really, really well. I used to call him the bear. He hated that. Yeah. I used to call him the bear. He reminded me of a bear, you know, who <laughs> ripped things apart. Yeah, tell us, tell us the one about him and Chris Eagles and the medicine ball. Oh, he wouldn't want me to do that because that was very, very embarrassing. <laughs> I don't remember this, by the way. He's making the story up. There's no way Chris hey, Eagles, he was a freak Chris Eagles. This he was. is the truest story I've ever told. It's good. Ben. Yeah, so we're in, in the, uh, the, the big gym at Carrington, you know, not where the weights yeah, are and yeah. everything in the big gym. Yeah. And we had a medicine ball. And there was me, you and Davo, right? So Davo was saying, Let, let's try some throws. So of course you throw it up and then uh, see how far it can go. And then, oh, I can do more than that. Davo was saying, I didn't get involved. I was just watching you two. It's nothing to do with me, this, you know? Yeah. And so you're throwing it up and then Davo gets a bit further. You say, oh, well, I can't believe that. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit the roof. I said, you better be careful you start hitting the roof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd be brilliant. Tough. So the, the two of them there, they're getting very, very close to the roof. This is a five kilo. Davo's a big bloke as well, you know. Oh, Davo's a big, strong, strong yeah, bloke, honestly. Really Lean, well, big old biceps, like yeah. big, strong bloke, weren't exactly, he? Yeah. yeah. Not quite as big as him. Nah, no chance. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. But you see, this skinny little pin box in the gym. And I said, who are you? He said, oh, uh, I'm called Chris Eagles. Have you never heard of me? <laughs> oh, I've never heard of you, mate. He said, what are they doing them to? I said, well, they're working on a bit of power, you know, Ben's a goalkeeper, you know, he's got do all sorts of power stuff, you know what I mean? He said, oh, he said, that looks quite easy, that. I said, oh, don't say that to him, he'll rip you apart. I said, can I have a go? I said, Ben, throw that medicine ball over. Chris Eagles picks it up, six stone two, and launches it at the roof and it hits it. <laughs> Some people were very, very <laughs> upset at that. I could not believe it. Well, I know it. how competitive you are. Oh, exactly. mate, it hurt. Yeah, it hurt. So then, you know, he couldn't hit the roof, Ben, nor John. Only Chris did it. And then, oh, let's throw it this way. Let's throw it that way. Yeah. And throw it at walls and everything. But, you know, it was a bad day for you, that wasn't it? It's fine. I don't <laughs> mind it, mate. Cause, uh, like, uh, that, uh, don't get me wrong. At the time, it, I was fuming, mate. I was absolutely raging. But, but Eagles was, he was like a freak of nature. Like, he, he was, he was, he was so slight. He was skin and bone almost. Yeah, like, was, slick yeah. back hair, eyebrows plucked to within an inch yeah. of their lives. Everyone was just going, this is just ridiculous. Like, what's the point? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? i tell you what we used to do, Claggy. Well, I didn't used to participate, but um, this is how comp we used to have the odd night out in Leamington where we live obviously and Fozzie's favourite thing he used to do was um, do you remember we used to walk yeah. down the street and there was like a sign the, you know, you like know signs old, would be shop hanging shop sign off, off or, a chain yeah. street signs or whatever it was high right but it was just within the realms of can you touch it or not yeah. so if, your favourite thing to do was when you'd have like uh, another goalkeeper would join us for a night out or something it was take them down this street and see who see can hit the sign. <laughs> who can jump the highest and hit this sign? So he's always on the job, you know, even on a night out. Oh, yeah, exactly. but like, yeah. That's the enthusiasm I was talking about before that you've yeah. got to try and control yeah. it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that's always been the thing. I, I remember, Cleggy, I remember back in the gym at, at, um, at United, it was when they first introduced, um, it was towards my sort of the end of when I was at Man United. Um, but they, they just first introduced these, you know, the Kaiser machines that had yeah, the yeah. readout, the yeah. max power readout yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. They had just introduced these machines into the, um, into the, into the gym and all the lads were going crazy because Cleggy hated them. Cleggy absolutely hated them, right? Because it was, um, because it gave you a readout, yeah? You could, you could sort of like do little competitions and stuff. You could do max power stuff like that. And there, were, there was lads coming in, like they'd just been training for two hours, right? And lads were coming in on these like squat machines and like going, I could beat that. And then they'd put it onto a harder level. I could beat that. And you'd get them like cold and like tired and stuff. And they'd get onto these things. Bah! And they were just to try and get the high score. And I remember Cleggy was just, you were kicking off all the time. Big time. Big time. 
during that time is when Wayne Rooney was doing it. Ro Rooney was the main one. Rooney, oh, honestly, was a was a was because he, he's an animal. Right, like absolutely, and he is competitive as heck. Like if you think I'm competitive, right? He is. It could be tiddlywinks, and that guy will kick off, and he's trying to he's trying to be the best he could. So the the one machine I'm talking about, it's like it was like a squat one That's where you right. had the pads on the pads your shoulder, on, and, and you got you down. Yeah. And you had to push up ah, and give it that, and make the. And we had a board behind the thing yeah. of the high scores and stuff like that. Exactly. He was going mad for it, weren't he? He's got, you know, he's got a, a bad injury. He's yeah. coming through it, and it needs to be overload training principle, bit at a time, no straight onto it, whacking it out, and that's how you get breakdowns. All yeah, time, you know? I know that that can destroy careers. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so I was going absolutely ape shit about it. <laughs> that's crazy so, so here's another question for you then Clegg because Ben is a advocate he's obviously in the goalkeepers union and will always protest that goalkeepers aren't the mad ones um, what's your opinion on the goalkeepers Come on, well, he obviously doesn't know much about goalkeepers then <laughs> because all the goalkeepers are crackpots you know what I mean they're not even footballers when all said and done yeah. you know they, they just throw the ball, the ball about and die can I, can I just say you've worked with some of the biggest boys as well by the way you've worked with Bartes yeah. Yeah. Schmeichel, did you work with him for a little no, bit? No. Didn't get the chance to work. No. So Bartes, Van der Sar, you've had yeah. Tim Howard, yeah. um, some Roy proper Carole, yeah. Roy Car some proper yeah. big characters, big goalkeepers. What, what about the first one, Mark Bosnich? Oh, Bo oh my yeah. gosh, he was really interesting. He was a really interesting character because he's one of these who thought doing so certain types of training is going to help him. And before I came, he had his own personal coach. Oh, okay. And the, the, the problem was, as I went in, I was like say doing power development this was, this guy was like a strength coach yeah. and he was having him doing lots of heavy weights yeah and you could see cuz I, I i was a a watcher of the games at that time cuz mike was on the fringes and everything you know you sometimes get a game and everything so i'd watch and i thought bozzy has got a load of really good traits yeah but he's doing all this heavy weight lifting what, what, what sort of heavy weight what are you like talking legs over legs or bench and, and stuff upper body yeah everything oh, okay yeah, yeah. yeah. legs yeah. and upper yeah body. okay so they were going for strength yeah, and you know you can say well you need a lot of strength and stability in goal but you also need to be you know reactive and be able to really yeah, be sure, more yeah. powerful than str strong you know what I mean it's not often you're holding somebody off with your arm exactly is it? yeah you know what I mean so I, I said to him listen you know you need to be getting rid of all that stuff you're putting on weight yeah. whatever you are <laughs> the harder it is to jump exactly, and start yeah. putting a five kilo plate on your back yeah. and start trying to jump as high as you did before and I, I, I really saw you know Big change. Big changes. Really. And uh, and then, of course, he disappeared. You know, I mean, I didn't know anything about that, you know, why or whatever. Yeah. But uh, that was that when they brought Bartes in? Was it Bartes was after Bo um, yeah. Bosnich, Bosnich, yeah. yeah. I, I can't remember the, the sequence. Well, if, if you had to, if you had to categorise, like, if you had to describe, try and do a bit of a sort of, like, general sort of explanation of each position, right? So just, it's goalkeepers, defenders, midfielders, strikers, right? Let's let's try and do a blanket sort of description of yeah. what they're like as characters, what they're characters. like as people, right, okay. traits that they might have, for example, right, yeah? yeah? We'll start with... Goalkeepers, crackpots. All right, so we've got that. There yeah, we go. goalkeepers. So, so he always defends the goalkeepers, but you mate i'm not being funny look what you're up to at the moment that would that would say that there's an element of um if you look crap potness yeah. in there. your life now and track it back to being a kid i would say the traits that you're showing now are exactly the same as a kid yeah because you're good at being crazy yeah you're good at doing you just got to channel it it's exactly what you said there about putting your camera in the corner of the goal and getting yeah. away with it by filming things and you know it, it listening to your voice and then you you're showing people and letting you know out on the radio and stuff like that that has got there's a certain top of, type of mind that is able to do that yeah like you know walking down the street seeing a sign so going for it and then getting everybody to do it because you wind people up now as i see you <laughs> you know as you a really do at the back you're winding people up you're talking all the time you're shouting at them. i love it i love that because you need to keep people at the back because there's so much going on especially the defenders you know they're watching so much especially at united because we had really good defenders yeah. and we used to be attacking a lot back in the day when i was there you know what i mean attack attack, attack. so yeah, it's course. dead easy for the defenders just just to switch off the tiny bit and then you get caught yeah well you weren't they weren't, weren't going to fall asleep with you at the back there was they? shouting you know away I mean? right exactly. so I mean, do you honestly believe that goalkeepers a little bit crap but a little bit mad yeah yeah i mean okay. the, the one that probably wasn't was edwin yeah now, he, he was like, in, in some ways, he was like a scientist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He just knew his way about the, the 
goal and, and the area. The world, mate. He knew his way about everything, didn't he? He was incredible. Yeah. Yeah, he... Who was who was the like goalkeeper wise? Because uh, Fabian Barthez was quite interesting, wasn't he? Yeah, well, it was because he, he he wouldn't train as a goalkeeper. I mean, um, Tony Colton, yeah, used to train him. Yeah, so he, he wouldn't he didn't want to do goalkeeping training. He just wanted to play out. <laughs> so he was playing out like the kid at school. Yeah, honestly. And then Tony said, "Right, let's go." Oh, I can't, I'm knocking now. I need to go. Uh, I need to go in the gym. Because he wanted to train his chest. He only wanted to train his chest. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, Cleggy. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, he used to go in the, in the, uh, in the, where the ladies were doing the, the washing and everything. Yeah. And uh, he used to have a fag with yeah, him. You know, he did, yeah, he did, So he'd always come in. Then I, I heard he would have him at half time and stuff like that. Like yeah, exactly. He would, he, at yeah, half time he, during games, like he, in the Premier League, he would go into the toilet. He would find, like, if he could get a window open or something like that <laughs> and just have a little cheeky fag kind of thing. It's incredible, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, it, it is incredible. But if you look at certain things, I mean, goalkeeping is in and around a small area. Yeah. But he was really fit. So I think one of the things was keeping really fit because he knew he was a smoker. Yeah. And he didn't want to stop smoking. So he did all that work out on the pitch, which would be more work in total than he would do just doing the goalkeeping. Yeah, stuff, sure, you know yeah. What I mean? And he, he had such good eyes and such good reflexes that, you know, when, when he got in trouble as regards being in goal, then yeah. he could pull out amazing saves. Yeah, he was a like cat, that, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so he worked around his, his, his traits. Yeah. You know, and this is the thing. Honed about his traits, people. basically. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He looked at well, this is me, this is who I am, what I want to do. How can I get the best out of everything here? And that's what he did. He used to drive Tony round the bend. Yeah. You know, but it, it's like he ended up um, going out with Linda, didn't he? Linda Evangelista. Oh, yeah, bloody hell, yeah. Exactly. Supermodel back in the day, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, the thing is, he comes to me one day, he said, uh, my girlfriend, uh, she's, um, she's got this uh, running machine from America. He said, uh, but she's not, it's not working. Do you think you'd be able to fix it? I said, I don't know. I'll have a look if you want, you know. I had no idea, by the way. <laughs> so he says, oh, can you go on such and such a time? You know, and uh, obviously there's always people in the gym and he's asking me. And, th and then they said to me, do you know who his girlfriend is? I said, no. Is it Linda Evangelista? Yeah. Are you kidding? He said, no. Proper old school model back in the day. Like, exactly. wow. Incredible. Exactly. Yeah. So I had to go to their, uh, their apartment just yeah. in Manchester on Deansgate. So I'll go down there and I knock at the door and Nothing happened, then knock again. And then, you know, the, she's got one of these eye things, yeah. you know. And I'm thinking, oh, she's there behind that. Uh, anyway, she, the door opens up. There's this old lady there, you know what I mean? I thought, oh, that doesn't look like Linda, you know what I mean? And she, oh, come in. I'm thinking, where's Linda, you know? <laughs> anyway, you know, she you know, I, I got her hair in, in curls, curls and, and stuff. all that sort of stuff, no makeup on. And she had some skinny pajamas on or something mm -hmm. like that. And it wasn't for at least 10, 15 minutes that it, it, I worked it out, it was her. Yeah. You would never have thought that she was that supermodel until she starts to speak to you. Yeah. And that's when you see something completely different because the personality, the way she was, was like, wow. Really, yeah. What a beautiful woman. You can imagine then, as she's starting to talk about the problems she's having and that she was asking me about me doing personal training for her and I need to do, you know, work this, that and the other, you know. And it's like, oh my goodness. It's not actually the looks that, that's beautiful about yeah. this woman. It's her personality. She's uh -huh. absolutely fabulous, you know what I mean? Wow. And so it was, uh, it was a fantastic day. Um, can we... Um, I, I mentioned Bartes with his cat-like reflexes. I think we need to introduce um, the fourth guest on this uh, podcast today, by the way. Um, we've actually got a dog sitting on the floor, T. It is Cleggy's dog. And uh, Cleggy, do you reckon you can just get him to stand tea. up for a minute? T, come here, quick. Look at this boy, come here. Hey, T. Is this being filmed? Yeah, of course it is, T. I haven't got any makeup on. Oh, come <laughs> here. You would realize how old I am. Look at this dog, how beautiful is he? Come here, you. Oi. T, come here, what's this? Say hello, you. Oh, you're Think he's first dog on the podcast. Oh, boy, there you go. There you go. You're a goodish boy. <laughs> yes, you are a goodish boy. <laughs> You finished, Fuzzy? <laughs> <laughs> I just keep looking at him on the floor down there. Oh, just thinking, I just want to stroke him. Yeah. He's such song. a good boy. He's 18 months old, he is, by the way. And he's just been sat there like good as gold, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. First ever dog on the pod, Cleggy. Um, okay, so we talk about goalkeepers. And um, one exception to the rule, Van der Sar, I agree with you. He's like, um, just... Phew. If ever there was somebody who's under control of absolutely every facet of his life, it's that guy, isn't it? Absolutely. Brilliant. Absolutely top class. Um, 
defenders how would you categorize defenders what do you think the mentality needs to be or what you've seen in your career of what defenders are well i i think in in a lot of ways um more fullbacks i'd say than than center backs yeah is they tend to be a little bit nervous and worriers yeah you know they, they, they worry because they've got to be involved in the attack and also involved in uh, yeah, the defense yeah. they tend to be a little bit shorter yeah <laughs> than the center you know than the uh, center backs and i always found that you know personalities like dennis Irwin and gary neville and, and people like that they tend to have this um little bit of nervousness about them so when they're in training they would ask you more questions about what you're doing and why. Ah, okay. I mean, Gary Neville was the worst of the lot. Yeah. But what a great guy he was. Yeah, you know for what sure, I mean? yeah. I mean, he's, he was a couple of years older than our Michael, and our Michael was trying to break through. But Gary had done such a good job, yeah. especially with his partnership with David Beckham, yeah. that he really was, the, you know, the number one... Um, Starting right back, basically. Right back there, yeah. yeah. Um, but you could tell that he was quite nervous about, you know, I've got to go out and... and really perform yeah you know what I mean so he was looking at every aspect now the great thing with Gary is that um he, he had to cut out some from what his nervousness yeah you know what I mean so he played guitar yeah and he were telling me that um he, he had this kid who was um teaching him guitar guitar you see why why did he want to play guitar just something to get away from really football. yeah to switch he off plays from football and... 23 and a half hours a day yeah true yeah. in his dreams of playing yeah. football because that that's his nature you know he's a very dedicated lad yeah he was the biggest moaner i've ever come he's incredible across. wasn't oh, he never stops moaning but that's all about that bit of nervousness and yeah. wanting things right which i don't disagree with yeah, you know yeah. what i mean so uh, he, he was having guitar lessons off off this kid and then uh, he ends up playing for the first team so I think he was paying something like 40 quid a session, or it might have been 20 quid, and he put it up to 40 quid, and he went absolutely mad. Because Gary. he found out he was a Man United exactly. footballer. So he, and he was telling me about this, and I said, how good are you? He said, well, I'm not very good, that's why I need a teacher. I said, well, um, I play guitar, not very well, I said, but I can give lessons, yeah. because lessons are simple. If you know how to teach something, if you you know got an process album. you know the, exactly. how to pro yeah the processes exactly. it takes yeah. so he, he used to bring his guitar in and i give him guitar lessons so that was really good because we then got on really yeah. really well and again it's all about relationships if you really want to get somebody to the top level you've got to have a good relationship with yeah. them it's not about crunching numbers on a computer and that's what i've always said that that's why i've always had my chair in the gym, never in an office anywhere. Yeah. So that people can come and talk to you because it's more about their personality, about their feelings that you need to know to really train them properly. Yeah, because then you can tell when they're struggling, then you can tell when they're on, on the eye. And that really, to me, was the skill of Alex Ferguson. Yeah. Because he didn't do many coaching sessions. What he did was watch everybody training under the likes of Steve McLaren and you know um, Mickey Phelan yeah. and Carlos Quiros came in. He just used to watch the sessions, pick the team, and that obviously give the team talk. But the rest of the time, he was observing the players. And that's what I learned so much from that, from his observation and just seeing what he was like as he's walking around the place. Because yeah. all the lads were coming into the car park at the back, you know, as you remember, and yeah. his office was there, so yeah. he was overlooking. So when he was walking in, having a laugh and a joke with your mates on the on the. Uh, telephone as you were going in he's watching you yeah and then he's watching you as you're going out onto the training ground having a laugh with the lads which you always were you know to go and train he's watching all that he's seeing everybody what they do what their traits are and he's his mind was able to take in a lot of knowledge I, I believe i never saw it but i believe he had four televisions set up together in his in his front room he's yeah. watching four different games at the same time <laughs> now that's incredible that's but you see if you watch somebody like Alice Ferguson goes into the canteen, he might not even re recognize it himself, but he's watching everything and he's seeing what people are like. He's looking at personality because he knows out on that football pitch, it's personality that's going to take the, the yeah. furthest. Personality. You know, of course you've got to be able to play football. You wouldn't be there if you weren't, but it's the personalities. And I heard all the time over the 11 and a half years that I was there, people saying, oh, he's picked the wrong team today. He should have had him and he shouldn't. But there, he's watching the players all the time. Yeah. So he knows who's up for it. He knows. Better than anyone. Ex better than anyone. That's why he's so, so damn successful. Well, his office was in, like I say, it was on the corner, corner. of the building. And it? Um, it was. It was exactly like that. So he used to watch everything, right? And he would be watching training sessions. Sometimes he'd have a little walk down and he'd stand and watch at the side and stuff like that. Um, but then around the building, 
you knew he, you knew there was a chance of bumping into him somewhere. You knew it, and it was always like it would fill you with dread at times, honestly, because he he knew what he was doing, but he would put you on the back foot, didn't he? Absolutely. He was the master of it. Like he, whatever it was, however he approached you or addressed you or what he said, it would put you on the back foot. <laughs> and he must have had so many people sort of like blubbering and going, um, everybody. Uh, um, uh, he was the master. It was of incredible, it. wasn't exactly, it? It was yeah. something about him. It yeah, was incredible. Right. And even at lunchtime and stuff like that, he would come and sit with the lads yeah. he would sit next to somebody like it could be it could be me it could be cleggy there could be anybody one of the office staff and he would go and sit next to them and he would talk to them and it was just yeah he oversaw and heard absolutely everything didn't necessarily need to be on the training pitch training or coaching or he knew people knew how to do that that was obviously, fine it wasn't about that was it was like idle chit chat a thing because i obviously never met the bloke you've worked under him you've worked with him was he always talking to you for a reason? Was there always like a, a design to his conversation or would there be a bit of idle chit chat? I think there's, I think, yeah, the, even in the idle chit chat, I think there's a design behind it. Yeah, though. Do you exactly. know what I mean? He's a, he's a Scotsman. He knew his job. He knew what he needed to know about the players, their personalities. And so he would think of something to say. Yeah. And he would judge the reaction to what people are saying. You know, and, and that was a master key of his character yeah he's incredible wasn't he yeah. what a guy um okay midfielders so we talk about goalkeepers defenders um well hang on a minute what we we've only done right back and left okay right do now. a center back then give me a center I, back well I'm, I'm gonna give you a rio ferdinand okay and the reason i i talk about rio ferdinand is because he was one of the very first who introduced me to the the, the mind yeah so rio i used to watch him play and he always seemed to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You never saw him do a 15 meter sprint. Last ditch tackle, Last all that ditch, kind of stuff, a, yeah. An all out edder. Yeah. I used to say to him, you look like you can play the game, smoking a cigar. Yeah, with Rolls players. Royce. Yeah, exactly, yeah. With, your, with your slippers on. Now, how was he doing it? You know, and people said, oh, he can read the game. It's not about reading the game. It's reading what's going on in the game. It's speeds and directions, yeah. you know movement of the ball coming towards you then being moved off he's watching everything and his brain is geared to go into the right position for how he sees what's going to happen with the ball it's not about reading what somebody can do you know what formation it's seeing the ball and realizing where he stood as regards the person he's marking yeah or might be two he's marking and he was just always in the right place at the right time so he didn't very often have to do last ditch tackles and stuff like that yeah now the mind of somebody like that is really interesting to talk to and to listen from um, because he gives you lots of different ideas about the way he thinks and then you can judge it by somebody else. Now, the thing about Wes Brown, I knew Wes, he was younger than our Michael. I knew Wes from uh, quite young because I was going watching the youth team and all that yeah. as Michael was coming through. Now, Wes was a really fit lad. You know, he was really fast and all. But the thing with Wes, he, he didn't have the same thing as Rio where you could read where you needed to be. That's why you'd see him do last ditch yeah. tackles. He'd go too far out and make a tackle, tackle and then get an injury and stuff like that. And so if if he'd have had more of Rio's yeah, attributes, yeah, yeah. he would have had less injuries and gone on a lot longer and played at a lot higher level. But at the time, it wasn't easy for me to really understand how I could help Wes. You know, we did certain, he loved the boxing like yeah. Roy. So we could do that. But talking specific football, You've got to be careful in the early days when you first go in. And he was one of the, well, it, it was him and Rye were the first people that I did first team players, you know, in the gym. And they were very, very good to me in the way that they uh, helped m my progress in making sure people was coming in because they, yeah. they advertised for me, if you like. So it, it was great. And it's only years later, like with our Michael, there's certain things where I think if only at the time I'd have realized, well, now I've got that knowledge. And so I can impart the knowledge of being able to say to them, Different way because you've got to be careful how we speak to players. Rio, and I say he didn't play so well. Yeah, <laughs> he nearly lost him. Yeah, yeah. And, but he um, was judging at the same time yeah, though. Exactly. He was, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I found it, what you just said there really interesting about the Wes Brown thing about 
he would go out of position he'd go too far somewhere but that made him susceptible to injuries that's yeah. like you don't think about it like that do you no. you don't think that that might be a reason why players are picking up certain injuries because they have to do the last ditch tackles and when you're doing the last ditch tackle it's because you are straining every sinew of your body to get back and block something you and strength at range isn't like as good as in like if you're sticking your leg out for example and it's at right at the end and the ball catches it that's yeah. at its weakest point that's a, that's when you're picking injuries up, for example, which is that's phenomenal. I've never really thought it's about it. It's incredible insight yeah. with Rio. Uh, I mean, in particular, I I obviously will talk about Cristiano Ronaldo in a, in a few minutes. But one thing I noticed with Ronaldo when I watched him a couple of times this season is how, as he's got a little bit older, he's still an incredible specimen. But how he manages his game management and how he moves around the pitch. And I guess with Rio, someone of a similar era, would it be fair to say that Teddy Sheringham probably? had the career at playing at that top level because of how he thought around a pitch as well. Well, um, Tony Colton will bear this if he ever hears this podcast and, um, and Jim Ryan. So I was asked when I first went into United, um, who's the fittest player at United at the moment? So I spent about a week having a look at all different aspects. And when I went in and told them they all laughed, they absolutely laughed. I said, no way. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. I said Terry Sheringham. Teddy Sheringham. <laughs> Terry was his brother, I think. <laughs> oh, I didn't know what to say, Teddy. <laughs> Teddy Sheringham. Right? And they was laughing at me. I said, what's up? Oh, he's too old. There's no way. How old was he at the time? I don't know. I think he was like 30, 34. 34, 35. 35. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what happened at the end of the season? Player of the year. Wow. So they laughed at me and they said, you, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, they was, they was having fun with it. You know what I mean? But it turned out, and you see... People judge a person's age before they judge a person's mentality. Yeah. And if people get an opportunity, and that it was great working with him that year, because I learned a lot from Teddy, because he, he's an older player. And I learned so much from the way that he looked at life and looked at how to play football and the way he steadied himself and made sure he stayed really, really fit, really, really hungry for what he wanted to do. Yeah. And it, it was, it was amazing. And so I was very fortunate that Teddy was there and I made that statement because after that people trust you because I weren't in football yeah. I'm coming from the outside how do you get trusted by people who've been in the game Jim Ryan and Tony Colton you know have been players at the very highest level you know uh, how would they trust me yeah. because they said a few things uh, you know to say well yeah, sure of course you know, yeah. and all that, which is banter but also you could, could be honest you know yeah, what I mean yeah. but in that one you know, I I proved my worth, if you know what I mean. You know, so right uh, midfielders. Talk to me about midfielders. What what yeah. what is the the psyche of a midfielder? How do you think they are as people compared to the other two positions? We've they had? are so different. Each midfielder is so different. That's the thing about him. You can't categorize. How can you categorize a midfielder like Roy Keane with Paul Scholes? Yeah, true you that. Tell me that. Yeah. So Paul Scholes. When I talk about Paul Scholes, I'm a athletic development guy. You know, power development. He's a non-athlete. He wasn't fast. He didn't have great injury capacity. Was he strong in the gym? Did he do these he 120 didn't do really kilos? anything, no. Exactly. Yeah. But I tell you what, what I noticed with Paul, which was an absolute breakthrough for me, was when I used to do this speed reaction thing with the pads, you know, where you do punch, yeah, punch yeah. Or kick, kick, and then you have the cones around, and I used to shout. Yeah. In that three-meter space, nobody could touch him. He could turn so quick. But also, if you've got seven cones out, all different colors, Whereas everybody, because I, I used to talk to him and he used to taunt him and stuff like that. Well, like that's why he used to get thrown around like a, a rag doll, you know, <laughs> wrestling. But I used to taunt him. And you look at Paul, whenever I was talking, he wouldn't necessarily look at me. But when I shouted out a colour, no matter where they were, because I was moving around, if you remember, yeah. this way, that way, he knew where the comb was every time I spoke it. Nobody had that ability. Yeah. Nobody could see. It's almost like he had eyes in the Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. And what he was able to do was to get there first and get back so quick. It was incredible. I couldn't even use the pads as quick as he could move, you see. Yet, if you see him doing a 40-meter sprint or, you know, yeah. a, a jump or, a, you know... He's not going to beat most people. No, so, no. It's a good question for you then. So if you were to, to apply these, these, these skills, these challenges to an under-11 team, like um, lads or, or girls' football team, do you reckon you could start picking out potential, like players in terms of awareness or obviously speed is quite an obvious one but the unobvious ones like awareness spatial awareness 
do you think you could kind of pick that out at a young age yeah, that's what i have to do that's my job that's yeah what i do now you know what i mean you see i i was just in the gym um doing power development which has a lot of different aspects but i was never teaching skills football skills and if you teach in football skills and seeing the awareness of how you've got to move and the directions you've, you've got to turn in uh, whilst a ball keeping the control and being able to accelerate decelerate i mean uh, get yourself into uh, the right positions uh, and strike the ball stuff like that that is all about the brain you know you've got the athletic athleticism but then it's about skill skill is a massive subject and i never touched skill that's why i went into speed my company scores cedar speed because i wasn't actually well i was a football coach but not at the level the lads yeah. i was with but of course, I'm learning from these guys. They didn't realise they were giving me all of my secrets for you. Uh, you yeah, know, years to years come. On. Exactly. But I, I, I turn, turn the uh, see the speed. I was saying speed is in the brain; it's not in the muscles. And so I studied the brain, how it works, to be able to make people faster. But in doing a lot of work on that, actually going to Montreal University, if you remember, bringing yeah. the neuro tracker in, was you still there? No, I, I remember you talking about all sorts of bits of bother like that. I remember getting, um, do you remember the big like tent they got? They yeah, put yeah, up, that's, that, that's the, the Was that what it was? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah I remember yeah. them getting all that kind of stuff. So I was studying that, yeah. the brain at the yeah, time, yeah. You see, because this is all part of this power development. The yeah. power's in the brain, it's not in the brawn. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, you've, what you've got to do in the brain is layer all the different aspects, speeds, um, change of direction, uh, brain cognition, skill, power, strength, endurance capacity. All these things are layered into the brain to become a great footballer. Well, you've got to have a sequence of, of layering. And also, you've got to be able to change from speed to strength to power to endurance capacity to cognitive processing in, in, in an instance, in milliseconds, to be very, very effective. And of course, I'm, I'm being taught all this stuff by these fantastic players who were top in the world you know what I mean so well, they had they had I remember at the time as well we had um Gail Stevenson didn't yeah, we exactly. so the eye lady so there was an uh, United at the time we had um an eye lady that we basically called her the eye lady Gail who, who sadly has passed away now but um she she had been at the club for a long time and a lot of people were very sort of uh, skeptical is that the word yeah, not skeptical absolutely. maybe probably just didn't think it really applied to them or didn't need to do anything but she she basically she was like um she would teach you to she, I remember teaching me basically to warm my eyes up. So when when I was about, well, she was like, when you play a game, do you you warm your muscles? Yeah. And she was like, do you know your brain, like your your eyes, all the muscles behind and stuff like that. Do you ever warm your eyes up? And I was like, no, never. Why would you? And she was like, I'm like, you need to start doing it. And she, I remember she made me get a Nintendo DS. It was back then, yeah. I was at Servo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, she used to get made me get the, one of these little Nintendo like gaming machine things, and there was like a brain training one, and there was one for your eyes specifically as well. Where and it was quite literally, you would be looking to your left, and then you had to try and see stuff out the right corner of your eye, and then you would have to pick the dots and blah blah blah. And honestly, it, your eye it improved. It yeah. improved she like had a little vision. speed, re speed yeah. reaction. Yeah. Uh, thing, you know, where the you, bat act uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah but little, she had a little one on yeah. the desk as well. Yeah. So this is where I learned the other aspects from people like yeah. Gail but nobody else did that nobody else no, in the world probably no, no, was doing exactly. that at that time but that she was she was in at Man United two or three times a week working with exactly. players like everybody as well you're talking Giggsy Skulls like Rooney Ronaldo wanted yeah her to be have access to every player because he wanted their eyes checked yeah now she was looking at the function of the eye like say the muscles and how they work and whether they're warmed up and whether they're strong and all that you know they do i went for an eye test yesterday and they talk about what's going on with the back of the eye whether it's healthy or not yeah well gail would be involved in all that and the, the reason it came about was united struggled early in one season i don't know if you know this story but uh, she came in because um she really because being a, a lifelong united fan yeah. she used to sit at the bottom of the stand and she could sort of see in line with the players. Now they started wearing a grey kit. Yeah, grey okay, kit. I remember this. And she yeah. recognised that they can't see each other properly. Is this where this kit? came from? Yeah. Do you remember the grey kit where they Southampton. lost to Southampton? Southampton, Southampton. Yeah. they changed it yeah. half time, didn't yeah. they? Exactly. And it was Gail that had, had prompted them because she was going to the matches and said, it's the kit. So then Alex Ferguson brings her in and then she sets off on her journey, which was great because we had her in there, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every hour. And so they were getting proper eye tests on all these things. And this is the thing with Sir Alex Ferguson. He brought all these things in, yeah. different things. I mean, he used to do massage at one time you know, as a manager. He wow. used to do massage. So then eventually he said, I can't do this anymore. Let's bring some more massage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So this is the thing about building, like with Brian Kidd, like he's trying to, you know, uh, it didn't work with me because, uh, you know, like I was saying, he probably went, you know, up to the first team a bit too quick with the things he was asking me for. But there was a live, the whole place was alive. It was a unit, a, a team working together. The relationships were fantastic. Yeah. And that's where what it's all really about, relationships. Yeah. Because within the relationships that get on, guess what there is a lot of? It's called love. Yeah. It's love. Yeah. It's how you work together as a team, liking and I. This is my bit, and I'm working with them that relates to that bit, and then like me with the physios and stuff like that. Build a relationship. You've got everything you need. I think this is this is without doubt, mate. Honestly, one of the biggest things that people, I, I think, football fans don't realize this is so essentially important within any, not even like business, football clubs. You have to have this culture of like a bit of love almost. Everybody has to be on the same page. Everybody has to be working together and wanting the best for you and wanting the best for you and wanting him to do well. And it, then, uh, that's what it has to be. And I think we have sort of got away from that a little bit in football we nowadays, haven't we? The thing with United is they brought it back in. Yeah. They brought it back in with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer mm -hmm. and he was doing a good job. He was setting up. Now you don't always win straight away. Yeah. But you set the structure out again, yeah. what it used to be like when Alex Ferguson was there. Obviously, he's gone on and, and, and other people have. But other people have to understand what Ollie was doing. And it's amazing that they suddenly sacked him like he did because, yeah. the, you know, they weren't winning, uh, you know, the, the, the whatever. games. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, but he was setting the structure. He was setting everybody in line because he remembers back before any of us came along yeah. in the 90s, you know, and then how it in, in from 2000 to 2010, when he was there, you know, he's looking at all the different things um, Alex Ferguson's bringing in and his staff, and he's recognizing where each, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. You're putting the jigsaw puzzle together. Then, of course, you know, people leave, like I left myself and Alex Ferguson ended up retiring, etc. And you lose it all. New managers coming in don't understand yeah that relationship that you've got and how everybody's job is so important. They, they, uh, they get rid of this and bring somebody else in. He's my mate, you know, so he can come and do yeah. his job. It's a culture, that. isn't it? That, yeah, and absolutely. you can't, you can't develop and uh, hone a culture in a season. No, can you? Absolutely. Oh, God, no. It's a lot longer well, than that. Well, managers don't even get we... a season nowadays. Mate. No, they, they don't. Yeah. Well, to me, oh. they get seven games. If yeah. you lose, lose the first seven games, you're yeah, down you're the gone. Oh, yeah. So the thing is, these people who bring people in, I think they need to look at what they've done before and the relationships that they built in the clubs that they were successful yeah. and recognize they've got to do some work before they bring a coach in to, for him to understand what's mm. going on, you know, and for him to have a similar thought pattern as what's going on. Because just going in with a big stick nowadays, don't work as a anymore. manager, don't yeah. work. It doesn't You know, uh... I love listening to Roy Keane when he's talking about what's going on with United and this, that, yeah. and other, and he'll say things about players. You're not allowed to do that anymore. I know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it's true. Roy does. Yeah. And that's why Roy Keane had really great control of the players when he was there. It was fantastic. Yeah, it's true. Fantastic days. But they don't want that anymore. You know, you've got all these protesters who would say, he shouldn't be saying this, he shouldn't be saying that. Yeah. But that's how you get the team together. It's a team and you have to have somebody with a voice. And he had a great voice at the time. He did. Roy was yeah. absolutely fantastic. He, he went once right once. Roy moved, it gave opportunities for others to come in yeah. and do their thing. So, I mean, they actually did really well after Roy left as well, but he kept it together for a long, yeah, long time. Yeah. Well, to and be he, fair, he had other people who, who, to be fair, could fill in for Roy, like likes of Gary Neville, you know what I mean? Yeah. People like that. Brian Giggs, even though he weren't the most vocal, if he said something, you listened. Absolutely. Didn't there you? was, a, there was you a, listened. a succession plan, wasn't there? There was a succession plan. Like I can imagine that when someone like Roy Keane leaves the club, it's going to leave a bit of a hole. Of course it is, but they've got strong characters yeah, the, the culture's there to bring yeah. the next ones through like you say yeah well what what it is somebody sees Roy go it's an opportunity for yeah. certain people I want to take that place yeah. exactly yeah. I remember him having a go at um, Alan Smith once yeah and um, so are you trying to take my place they said Roy absolutely not and, and he was serious he was not trying to take his yeah. place but he recognised the fact that I have to be a strong character in this team as it worked out you know he ended up with that horrific injury and he yeah. never yeah. Really got it back. Do you remember? Do you remember the season? I think it was before he got that horrific injury. He came back from pre-season at one year, and he was just poor oh, mate. Yeah. The, the pre-season had been with you, was it? Well, the the shape <laughs> of him was that that season with, with you. Oh mate, he was he was a joke, wasn't he? He he came back, hit the ground running. Like you could, see, everybody genuinely went wow. Like we might have a serious serious player on our hands here. Shredded, such like, a shame. Faster than everybody. Like outrunning people, like he wanted to be in the gym all the time. Oh, he was incredible! He was incredible. Yeah, yeah. he was a fantastic guy. He was a great lad, yeah. weren't he? Yeah, 
brilliant guy. Can we just um, touch on Skolzy? Because I've got a question which I'm really fascinated to hear your answer on. If Skolzy was in the Man United Academy now, the way that football is with big, powerful players and whatnot, if he was a 14-year-old kid in the academy now, Skolzy, would he graduate to the first team? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the mentality of learning what the others have got. That's what I'm saying all along. You've got to understand what they've got and what have I got. What can I compete with that against? That's the master blaster that who can look at what other people have got and think, I am worried about you because I'll do it this way. And if I can't do it that way, I'll do it another way. Yeah. So he used to sort things out in his mind to be able to do it. And Oli Gunnar Solskjaer was very similar in the fact that very often he was sat on the bench. What do you think he was doing? Chin down. Oh, I've not been picked yeah, or moxing yeah. and all this sort of rubbish. You know, oh no. No, he thought, well, you know, there's a good chance that I'll get on at some point yeah. because the gaffer always does, gets me on. So what's he doing? He's watching players. What's he watching them? See if they might have a nice girlfriend or have a good car. No, he's watching how they move. Yeah. So he's watching each player that he might come into contact with in that game. Yeah, and looking so for looking, weaknesses. Exactly, he's looking yeah. for weaknesses and exploit the weaknesses and comes in and scores a goal. That's what it's about. There's your, there's your Paul goal. So there you go. Even now, that's you don't really get many of them nowadays. You don't. like To be fair, you've got to give it to someone like Divock Origi at yeah. Liverpool. Yeah. Very sort of similar thing where Jurgen Klopp will bring him on and he will score you a goal. He will, he does it. He brings him on with 10 minutes to go and more often than not, he's, he's scoring a goal mm -hmm. and he comes on with a smile on his face and it will be the same thing like Ollie was. He would be sitting there watching, thinking, Gaffer, you need to bring me on now because I can see this centre-back. If I go in that side of him there, it's a goal. I know for a fact it's a goal. And that was Ollie all over, wasn't it? Yeah, always absolutely. smiling, always happy. Yeah, you're on the bench today, Ollie. That's cool. That's fine. I'll sit there and I'll study the players that are in front of me and I'll wait for my chance. And when it comes, I'll score you a goal. Yeah. And he did it for the team as well. It wasn't about doing it for an individual. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to score a goal and yeah, I'm going to show everybody how good I am. It was, uh, I'm going to score well. a goal for the team and it's going to help us today. And that's what it but is. But isn't, isn't that what Jurgen, Jurgen Klopp's been at Liverpool for? All through it yeah How, brilliant what six seven years yeah now? six seven years yeah. and within that time he's built that culture hasn't exactly he? yeah exactly yeah he's built like what man united had back in the day exactly. where everybody was just doing it for the team they were helping each other out and that's all it was about brilliant isn't it yeah fantastic uh, we, we've got to ask you so obviously um we haven't touched on mr ronaldo yet so in your book, The Power and the Glory. So we'll put a link in the description down below. It's a banging book, it's by the way. It's a great Cleggy, book. I don't even read books and I've read your book. That's saying something, mate, honestly. I even... bet you fell asleep a few times. No, I haven't. I no, haven't. I, I read it on the way to work in the morning. I've got young Jamie here who's driving me and I've got to sit in the passenger seat and I've read it the last like, this last week and it has been brilliant, mate. Absolutely enjoyed every second of it. Normally... So, so like you say, link in the description down below because it's a belter, mate. Yeah, it's a banger. No normally, I think... I. I... I'm not a massive reader, but I tend to read sports autobiographies. And what I loved about it was that it's, it's you know, you're not an athlete at Man United. You're um, part of the coaching team. So it's that really unique insight as to kind of coach-player relationship. And, um, and can the, I just say as well, stories, yeah, some, some of the, the stories are incredible. And you'll read the book, honestly, right? What you'll do is you'll read the book and you'll build this picture in your head of what yeah. Mike Clegg is as a person. You'll probably be thinking of like a little gremlin or something like that, right? And you're exactly <laughs> right. That. And that's Michael Clegg. He's a little gremlin, but he's a legend. Like he's a proper, proper bloke, proper person. And we're thankful for you here today, mate. So, right, what are we talking about? Big, big Cristiano boy. Cristiano Ronaldo. CR7, yeah? Right, um, mate, talk to me about Ronnie. He's the man, weren't he? Yeah, I'll... Have you ever seen anybody as 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 driven, as dedicated, the has got the ability, the the pace, the whole package, basically? Have you ever ever seen anybody quite to that level? Because there's levels, but there's 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 Ronaldo level. Do you need to ask me that question? <laughs> that answers it all. No, because he come in with a plan. You see, kids when they're younger, they don't have the plan. Yeah, they don't see what's going on for them in their life, their growth rate, the things that they need to do. Again, it's all about watching other people. It's, it, he was doing a fantastic level. What I was doing as a coach, he was doing it as a player. Yeah. So he recognized what he can do and he can do, but you know, and he had to be able to compete with them, but also he wanted to be unique. He wanted to be just him, no, not like anybody else. So that's why he spent so much time practicing. We see there's a, there's a balancing act with practicing. You know, you can, uh, you know, you can train and train hard all the time. And we've got a lot of people who trained hard all the time, but that's not necessarily the thing. You see, you've got to train correctly. The most important thing in football is skill. And the most important thing in, in football skill is putting the ball in the back of the net because that's how you win. Yeah. Or a goal. So 
his mind is on, well, how do I score goals? And so he, he has to have the circuit tricks, the circus tricks, sorry, which people used to pull him down about. But he was practicing. He used United as an apprenticeship. And what he was doing was pre practicing everything that he needed to do to make sure that people couldn't spot him and think, oh, he's going to do this. Yeah. Or he's he's going to do that. You see, with most lads, when, when I've seen it over the years, they practice something, then they put it into a game. If it go, goes wrong, guess what happens? Stop. Never use Never it again. Never use it again. Yeah. But he weren't up to that. He thought, no, that's the wrong, uh, wrong way of doing it. I'm going to practice on my own, make sure I've done so many hours practicing that. Then I'm going to take it into the train. Now, who's he training with? Some of the best players in the world. Yeah. So he's trained and practicing these skills and understanding how they fit with these really great players, defenders and midfield players, you know, can take the ball off you. So he's, he's really understanding here in this brain all the different things that are necessary to get a skill. It's just like bringing out a new song for a band. It's a new song and everybody loves it. And it goes, well, he's developing new songs. Yeah. So what he does, he practices something uh, and then takes it into the training games and then he'll put it in a game. Yeah. But he's not going to put it in against Chelsea or Real Madrid. He's going to put it in against Derby County or nice, somebody down yeah, the that's, a good way that's of how it, you yeah. hone your skills. It's not rocket science. He was not a rocket scientist. He was a very simple lad who understood structure. Again, this is where I've got my ideas. They taught me. I never went to university. Yeah. I never had these great, um, you know, university lecturers teaching me. I was just a very ordinary guy who was watching his kids. And now somebody exposed me to all these incredible people. That's where I learned what I do. Yeah. It's by watching and listening to and having good relationships. Because we used to talk all the time like I did with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like to think that I've got two ears and one mouth. So I only listened... I listen twice as much as I talk. I don't yeah, I do, you no. listen. You've got two ears, one mouth, so you should listen more than what you talk. Of course, yeah. most people don't know that, yeah. and that's why they're getting serious problems with relationships, which is so important for for human beings. They want to rattle on about themselves all the time, yeah. and so they get up people's noses. You know what I mean? But you see, this is the thing. Cristiano came in recognizing that I need to do this, I need to do that. He wanted to be as good as he could be at what I could help him with. Yeah. And of course, we had a yardstick. Who's the best in the gym? Well, he weren't the strongest or the, well, he probably was the fastest, but the yardstick was Ryan Giggs. Yeah. He was the one most dedicated to training in the gym and outside as well. I saw him doing all that, but in the gym, nobody touched him. So when he came, he recognized that Ryan was the one who was doing all this stuff with that geezer in there, you know, I, I want to find out. And he, he asked me about what he does and all this. And of course, he made sure that he did as much as him, did he? No, of course not. More than him. If I want to be better than him, I he need was to the do first more one in him. in the morning, weren't he? Of course he was. He was the first one in by far. Not just messing about either. He was. He was good to Never go. Never messed. Yeah, not, not for the was, sake. Not nah, for the sake absolutely. of oh, I'm first. He was in, in the gym. You hear that a lot in football, don't you? He was first in last out. Yeah. That's if you're having a cup of tea. That's exactly. one thing, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. It's, so, it's the work rate that's important, but it's the work rate at the right type of work. Most players don't do the right mm. type type of work because they haven't got the guidance to do the right yeah. thing. You know what I mean? That's the thing. You were, you were talking before about specifics of different um, positions on yeah. the pitch. Well, they all have things that are more necessary than others from another position. Yeah. So they've got to be specific to what they want to do. In development, this is more difficult because as a 10, 12, 14, 16 year old, you could start off as a striker and then end up as a center back or start off as a winger and end up as a right back yeah. or, or vice versa. You know what I mean? So. You've got to allow yourself to learn across a range. That's why when you were talking about, well, if you picked a kid who was 11 years old, you know, what you could pick, pick out specifics. Yes, you could. But remember, they've got to do everything as well. They've mm. got to do everything yeah, plus yeah. the extra on this. And that's what they need. You know, you've got to be looking at getting everything in there because you're building a foundation. Yeah. And then what you do, well, spearhead for you, what you need to do, this particular guy is going to be great at making tackles. You know, you can put extra work into that. Yeah, hone those hone sort of those the, the essential skills, skills exactly. the yeah. one specific skills for, it, for whatever position exactly. you are. Build everything, but then as you get to, uh, even as a certain age, you need to get to an age where you go, right, I've got that in place now. I need to really drill down on it. And I think Ronaldo had already exposed himself to everything yeah. as a kid. He had done everything. Yeah, he yeah. must have played every sport going, I guarantee it. But then... He got to an age where he was like, right, I need to just now drill down and just come up with a complete repertoire of tricks and all blah, 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 so I can bamboozle everybody on a Saturday afternoon. They don't know where I'm going to go. Yeah. 
incredible, so, wasn't they? So when Ronaldo, so in your book, you said Ronaldo's come in and said, I'm going to be the best in the world and you're going to help me. When he said that to you, did you just believe him? Did you think, okay, or were you kind of thinking, well, he's, he's just talking here. Was this uh, early on in his career? Did he? Was this literally once he had signed, he came yeah, and yeah, said when, that? When he, he'd probably been a week. Yeah. Probably been a week looking round. Yeah. But remember, there's only one person I trust. Do you know who that is? Yourself? God. I love that. That was just me. <laughs> Man, I wouldn't trust you, Cleggy. Oh, I wouldn't either. <laughs> no, God, you see. So I don't trust anybody what they say. What I do is just use these things. Somebody said something, what do you do? You watch to see if they do it. Or yeah. they said something, then you listen for them saying it again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You've got to observe them. Now, if somebody comes in and says, which people are, I'm going to be the best player, blah, blah, blah. All you have to do is look at their um, work rate. Yeah. Are they working hard enough? No, they're not. Or are they going in the, in, in the canteen stuffing themselves with cakes? No, they're not. So it's very easy then, once somebody's made a statement, just to observe, which is what Alex Ferguson was the greatest at observing people's behavior mm. it's simple yeah. and it's how you learn relationships and then he was yeah. doing it he was coming in day in day out relentlessly doing was, it wasn't he well you know i've never seen there. anything like it what honestly. was he like um what was he like as a teammate ben he, he was incredible he um he had the, do you remember he, he's got this one thing i don't know if he still does it but he used to have um like don't worry brilliant top lad he was a lovely kid wasn't he to be fair to him like a, a, a lot of people think he's a big a bit of an ego and not he's not honestly behind closed doors he's, he's a he's a lovely kid he's a really good kid um he used to like being the last one out of the changing rooms so on a saturday afternoon right you know when all the lads would line up and go out and stuff like that he would he would love to be the last player walking out the last one in the line of 11 and it's like he, he, he would it's premeditated why he did it but it, it would be like everybody's because everybody was waiting for Ronaldo everybody wants to get a glimpse of the main man himself and he would make sure he was the last one walking out of that tunnel and then as soon as he walked out everybody would really start clapping really start giving it and I know for a fact he would have been that kind of guy who's gone yeah here we go then that's kind of given me a, a little bit more of a buzz as if he even needed it anyway but he would give him that little bit more as well and then that was it the, the rest was history he would go out and he would do well, exactly what he's always done would he socialize with the lads <laughs> yeah he was just like a normal lad he was like he was like anybody else don't get me wrong he's probably not hanging around in the the, the pubs and having a pint with you and stuff like that but he's he's hanging around with everybody else in the canteen and in the gym and stuff like that socializing having a chat what did you see on telly last night all that kind of stuff just normal normal, normal lad. Lad. yeah normal Absolute lad normal lad <laughs> um you, you said about um having monsters in the gym and powerful people in the gym and all that kind of stuff um there's one bloke who when we were when we were in the gym a lot and i was injured and i was coming back from rehab with my my acl because i think i was out for eight or nine months in total with my with my second acl there was one lad who was injured quite a bit with us um and i've got to say i think he might be the strongest person i've seen in the gym in my whole career was louis sahar louis was a f he was a joke wasn't he yeah. he was a man mountain machine seriously incredible wasn't he yeah, it, you know, to have a, a physique and the skills yeah. that he had was incredible, absolutely incredible. But why did he have so many injuries? Yeah. That was the thing that was always on my mind. And you know, you can pick up quite a lot by understanding um, people's home life and stuff like that. So I, I used to have a go at Louis because um, I, I, got, I had five kids. Now, you know, I'm a horrible old dad, you see, because I wouldn't let the kids in the bed. So I had to get up in the morning and yeah. work all day. Now, the trouble is with, and this is quite a few footballers, this, what they've got a job to do, and it's a big job, you know, it's not an ordinary job. They're earning fortunes because they've got to do something special. They've got to be better than others. And I had a, a go at Louis a few times because I asked him, oh, how'd you go on for sleeping and stuff? Because we had a big sleep thing. Yeah, remember. we did have a big sleep. I, I, yeah. I got this um, bed, bed by sleep num number bed. Sleep by numbers. Yeah, yeah sleep yeah, number absolutely. bed, yeah. yeah What's yeah. this, um? Well, well <laughs> this company said um, that, uh, you know, the players and certain staff, I, I did a little talk for him, you see, about sleep because I do a lot of it. You know, he's talking about, you know, painting my bedroom black you know, <laughs> so, and, and having nothing in there, you know, to interfere with my sleep. So I was really into that. Uh, I, I do a lot of meditation and stuff like that. So I did a little talk for him of the sleep by numbers bed people. And they give me one of these beds because they're absolute fortune. Yeah. And basically what it is, you, you press the button, you know, it, it can be 
uh, hardest is 100% of course it's air pressure it's all air done pressure, on air pressure exactly. basically so it can adjust it to how heavy you are at certain positions you lie in and you would add you, when they installed the bed they'd have somebody come round and they'd plug it into a computer and they would could see all the pressure markers so they'd know so eventually they'd find your exact sleep number wouldn't they yeah exactly so it's a great thing but you see um, during them days um, I was talking to Louis I had a, two or three kids at the time these beds were like 20 grand by the way yeah like 20 grand these beds were and every player and like most of the staff just got given these beds they were incredible yeah, absolutely and um louis was allowing his kids in the bed at night now i i know that if you if you've got to work hard next day and because i did myself you know what i mean you can't afford to have the kids in the bed now the fact is most people who are married have got a wife and very often oh very go, on, let them. go on let them yeah, have, exactly. let them come in yeah, yeah. And, and i said to him Right, you know, you need to get a bed on your own and stuff like that. He said, oh, you know, she'd go mad if I did that. Yeah. Louis, you know, but if you don't get the right rest, it means you're not healing. Yeah. If you want to get real healing, which he needed because he was having a lot of these breakdowns, yeah. then your sleep has got to be absolutely so important in your life. And it wasn't important enough, in my opinion. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I could be totally wrong. I'm not saying I'm right. But it's the one thing, because I lot, watched him train. He'd always warm up. Uh, correctly, he would do his stretching, his flexibility. He, you know, he do his skill stuff. He come in the gym, and like you say, he was a monster, weren't he? Yeah. But why did he get so many injuries? And and I know he had a good diet as well. Yeah, yeah. And he did it. The, oh, he did it properly. That's didn't the he? Yeah. only yeah. thing, and it's something that he wouldn't think about. Yeah. And of course, once you've started that, kids are getting in the bed. We all know it's very difficult to get them out. Yeah. Because they're crying, aren't they? Yeah. You can't sleep if they're crying. So really, what you've got to do is you've got to get another room. Get your own bed and if the kids get in you get out yeah as simple as that yeah and but there you go but and, uh, that's just a, another little thing that yeah I've of course yeah that, you're not saying that's that. the be or that's why he got so injury but injured sorry but it's it's definitely as a, an elite sportsman you have to look at every tiny little thing you have to have all the boxes checked don't you it's your training theories which i, I found fascinating like reading through some of them and the one I, I really kind of read and thought wow that's an interesting way of reading it was when Giggsy came to you and said he wanted to improve his crossing yeah could you just tell us a little bit about that well I mean that's probably um the most important insight I've had where something happens and you wonder where that knowledge came from and you know I said to you I don't trust anybody apart from yeah. God it's almost like somebody's opening doors like I said about you know getting the opportunity at United now, R Ryan's taught, he's had these problems with his back and everything, yeah. you know, he's had seats changed, beds, this, that, and the other. And I, I'd gone out and really studied on how best to train to make sure you got balance, et cetera, you know, for, for being a player. But then we build a, such a great relationship because he was in there a lot. I, I just, and I do this all the time, you know, what would you really like to work on? Because that's what I really want to work with people on, what you really want to do. Yeah. What, what's this, your speciality? You know, we've all got skills to be a footballer. You, you know, you're, you're fit, you're strong, whatever. You know what I mean? But what's your speciality? And he said, well, what annoys me is I've never really crossed the ball with my left foot like I really want to. I couldn't quite get it perfect. You know what I mean? I said, oh, that's interesting. And then I was, you know, not really watching him, but I noticed um, because somebody came in the gym and asked him for an autograph. And he's writing with his right hand his autograph. I thought, that looks odd. So I said, oh, can I have a look at that? And he, he was writing dead odd. I said, have you ever wrote with your left hand? He said, no. I said, have a go. So he picks the pen up, and as he's writing then, he could see that he was writing right. Yeah. It looked right. No, yeah. I said, do you ever use your left hand? He said, not really. Right. I said, why? What's that got to do with anything? I said, well, think about it. You know, the right-hand side of your brain controls the left-hand side, yeah. the left-hand side, the right. Now, you're left-footed, but you're using your right hand, and you're not using your left hand. So that means that a lot of this area here is not being trained as well as it could be. So if you started using your left hand a lot more, do you get the balance? Because, you know, you've got your right hand, you're using that anyway. You yeah. won't give that up. It's all, always brush his teeth with his right hand, you know what I mean? And I said to him, let's work on your left hand. So we started doing, I, I got a dartboard in, started getting him to throw darts. That was probably a bit before your time yeah. with that ball. But I bet it was still there. When yeah, you probably, there. yeah, yeah. And then I started having him, everybody loved table tennis. 
Uh, Steve Lyons yeah. used to come and wind everybody up. Yeah, exactly. Serious business. So I, I got him to um, use his left hand playing table tennis. And then once I saw how really good he was, I thought, Is it, I wonder why he's never used his left hand. Now, looking at history, things that go on, there might be a reason for that in the way that people think, you know, you should use your right, you not your left and all this sort of thing. But anyway, who knows? <laughs> what I decided to do was get him on this and then I got him in the main gym, you know, and got a fit ball and I said, right, I want you to run away. I can't believe he even listened to me either. Yeah. That was the thing. I was really just playing um, with his mind, trying to see what he was... Playing with of. one of the best footballers in the world <laughs> at this moment in time. It's bonkers, <laughs> isn't well, it? Well, that's right. Yeah. Roy Keane said to me once, we crashed test, dummies for you. Yeah, hello, know, yeah. Like you're just prodding us and poking us and like <laughs> exactly. taking stuff out, yeah. What do you do? You know, yeah. you're there, you're giving an opportunity. So I was throwing fit balls up in the air and he was running up the left-hand side and then hitting the fit ball as it's in the air. But I was making sure that he's using his left hand. You know what I mean? As he's getting himself ready for that kick. And of course, that then become more trained. It was far more well-trained. Yeah. So would that be like from a balance perspective? Balance, exactly. It was balancing, balancing the brain, balancing the body. And then suddenly you've got everything working together as a team. What do yeah. we keep talking about? Teamwork, relationships. You've got to have relationships. Everything talking. Exactly. Yeah. But listening a lot more than talking. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. And did he, did, he, did he hit a few more? Yeah, he did because there were, there were a few stats done. And they told me that I, he has it more. Improved. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was very fortunate. And that's where I, you know, I, when I went through the book and wrote everything, I, I, I didn't write it with Steve Barton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but obviously I had to write my own little story because mine's not an autobiography. That book is not my autobiography. Yeah, yeah. That's a book of stories. My autobiography would not mention a lot of that stuff. Yeah, sure, on. yeah, of course. You know, so, but, but it's a book of stories, but I had to write my storyline yeah to, i know yeah to make you have to narrate it a little exactly, bit it has yeah. to have a bit of you in there yeah, yeah. um uh, right then so cleggy you've been in you've been in sport you've been in power development you've been whatever for how long now many what 30 40 years yeah i started coaching when i was 20 bloody um, hell and what you're now 75 now yeah, yeah 80. no, 82 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah so so it's fair to say you've seen a few things and yeah. in your opinion if you had to pick one thing, which is pretty stupid and pretty hard to do, but what is the most important thing you need to be an elite level athlete? What is the one most important thing? I would say one thing, but then people would tend to, you know, pull funny faces at that. Yeah. Because we don't know how many are connected. But the most important thing that I've found through my life and talking to individuals is the most important thing is to believe in God. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Then it's not about any one thing. It's bringing everything together as one. So you become a unit. Now that's not just about yourself. It's about the people that you're with. It's about your family. It's about your friends, everything. It's trying to bring everything together as one, which is what God is all about. God is love. And then if you produce love through all your associations, all your friendships, you know, your relationships with your kids and your working partners and everything, if you go about trying to make friends rather than trying to, you know, have your own way. Which yeah. a lot of selfishness. Yeah. Exactly. Selfishness yeah. is one of the worst things that can happen. You could be the best that you can be. Yeah. So it's not about any one thing. It's about bringing everything into the one. And the thing that really glorifies that is God. Yeah. I think, um, I think as I've got older and in football, don't get me wrong, I'm not a religious person at all, but what I do believe in is you have to have a balance in life. You can't just be full headstrong on, you know the right way and this should be like that and I'm going to say it that way and I get my way. And it, it's not about that. It's about, yeah, you might be good at something, but then you've also got to work on other stuff just as important. You've got to have a bit of this. You've got to have a little bit of that. You've got to enjoy yourself away from it. Take time to relax and treat people and look after people, build relationships, that kind of stuff. And I think that is, maybe it does come, come into the sort of religion side of it a little bit. Like, But I think that is the most important part of not just elite sport, whatever it's about life is having a balance, all that I kind think, of stuff. I think what we've discussed with Man United here is testament to that isn't it everything that you two have been talking all the stories and anecdotes yeah. have kind of said 
it's all the same thing, isn't it? It's teamwork. It's 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 and actually adapting and trying new things. That's why and, yeah. United in those years, absolutely in their pomp, oh, smashed people out of the water, yeah. didn't they? But that's when you look at the evolution now. And it's sick. It's funny, isn't it? Football, like when we were kids, me and Ben are the same age, and we were uh, of Man United, weren't we? Like growing yeah. up, it was Man United. Before that, it was Liverpool. And then it's funny how it comes back around again, and it's now Man City and Liverpool. Yeah. But you look at look at the, the club and the main guy in charge yeah. and and it's an Alex Ferguson it's, it's not rocket science it's an Alex it? Ferguson it's Pep Guardiola but it's Jurgen Klopp but it's an Alex Ferguson it's that way of doing things but that's yeah. interesting what you said about Oli it's really really interesting because yeah. you start your mind starts wondering and go well maybe if he was given like yeah. another what two is, seasons yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What, what would the culture of the club be like what would the leaders that he'd have brought into the dressing room fascinating Cleggy you've been incredible mate Thank you very much. Really appreciate I, you coming in. called incredible before, so that's... Nah, you are. You're the man, mate. You are. <laughs> Thank you're the you man. so much. Um, and like I said earlier, guys, uh, we're going to put the link to um, the book in the description down below. The book is called, Cleggy. The Power and the Glory, which was not me who... who, uh, who... It's a good name either way, mate. What would you want to have called it? Well, I don't... I, you see, I weren't part of the glory. Yeah. The glory wasn't mine. I was just working in yeah, the Yeah, but gym, you won't you know? want to take the glory. I know you as a person, and that's not you. You don't care exactly. about so the I, glory and no. being told you're amazing and stuff like that. You just like doing what you yeah. do. So it, it was Reach, the, the company who made, who, who printed the book, who, yeah. who called it The Power and the Glory. Yeah. It was going to be, you know, power development some kind of power development thing that was definitely power of glory is just a bit more <laughs> no juicy, it's got razzmatazz yeah, it's a bit more juicy, what we'll yeah. do fozzy we'll buy three copies um and we'll do a giveaway shall we yeah boom uh if you want to win one by the way just get down in the comments below tell us what you thought of sir michael clegg today he's a friggin legend isn't he? No, sir, he is no, he's sir. a friggin legend um cleggy we always finish every episode by looking into this main camera here i'll go first tom next and then you um and we always say up the fozcast up the fozcast up the Fozcast. Go on. There we go. Fuzz. Thank you very much. Well done, mate. Brilliant. Well done. T, Thank come you. here. Come here, boy. Hey, what's T, come on. Come here, you good boy. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the Fozcast. Don't forget to give us a follow on Spotify. Up the Fozcast. <laughs>